Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Spiritualism was tremendously popular during the early years of the 20th century, with countless occult believers across most English-speaking countries. Mediums like Eusapia Palladino and Helen Smith regularly conducted seances for the rich and not-so-rich alike, and news of spooky happenings definitely sold newspapers. While Houdini's anti-spiritualism crusade helped deflate spiritualist claims, there was still enough interest for Ouija boards to be a common item in many homes. Which brings us to Pearl Curran having a quiet tea with her mother and a family friend at her home in 1913. Pearl was reluctant about using the Ouija board that her friend had brought to her home, but after some initial success with messages from someone on the other side calling themselves Pat C., the three of them decided to keep trying. On July 8 of that year, they received the following message. Many moons ago I lived again I come. Patience worth my name. Wait, I would speak with thee. If thou shalt live, then so shall I. I make my bread at thy hearth. Good friends, let us be merry. The time for work is past. Let the tabby drowse and blink her wisdom to the fire log. The entity in question identified herself as Patience Worth, and Pearl's life, as well as the lives of her family and everyone who believed in the paranormal, were about to change forever. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A home in India is grappling with an angry ghost that apparently has chosen to throw potatoes at it. It began with a blast the power of a nuclear bomb. Lights filled the skies. A fireball the size of the moon streaked across the sky. But this wasn't a UFO or anything paranormal or supernatural. This was all man-made, and it was only the beginning of something much more sinister that was planned. John Hatfield could not stay out of trouble probably due to the fact that he kept making up false identities for himself and getting into trouble with those identities. His antics were so well known that later a woman who created a falsehood about herself was accused of being an imposter just like him. We'll look at both of their strange stories. Long before Sybil and the Three Faces of Eve, there was Doris Fisher, and her case is still considered a classic. But first, how did Pearl Curran, an ordinary St. Louis housewife, become the center of one of the greatest paranormal mysteries of all time? We begin with that story. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. You can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated a free 24-7 streaming video channel of old horror movies and hilarious horror hosts. Also on the website, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness.
born Pearl Lenore Pollard in 1883. Her childhood seemed normal enough. By all accounts, she was extremely sensitive about her appearance and wished that she were more attractive. While not a good student, who eventually dropped out of high school, she had a passion for singing. Pearl's parents arranged for voice lessons and she eventually moved to Chicago to continue her voice training. To support herself, she worked in a music company and taught music herself. Whatever dreams Pearl had for a career as a singer or actress ended when she married John Howard Curran at the age of 24 and settled down to be a housewife in St. Louis, Missouri. At the time, Pearl had no interest in the occult, other than a little dabbling with a Ouija board, not uncommon at the time. She played piano, never read much, and had little education. She briefly thought of becoming an actress but gave that up when she married John. Her marriage was as uneventful as her childhood had been. The Currens were not rich, but they did make a comfortable living. Pearl had a maid to take care of the household chores, and she and her husband enjoyed going to restaurants and to the theater. They were a social couple and enjoyed meeting friends and playing cards with neighbors in the evening. They seldom read anything outside of the daily newspaper and some of the periodicals of the day and never really had an opportunity to associate with well-educated writers or poets. They were happy, though, and content in their middle-class home with their close friends and acquaintances. In the afternoons, while their husbands were at work, Pearl would often have tea with her mother and with a friend who lived nearby, a neighbor named Mrs. Hutchings. She believed that Ouija boards were a boring and silly pastime, having seen the pointer spell out nothing but gibberish. Then, to the lady's surprise, the message on the board seemed to make sense. Many moons ago I lived. Again I come. Patience Worth is my name, it spelled out. According to the spirit who called herself Patience Worth, she had lived in Dorsetshire, England, in either 1649 or 1694. The pointer included both dates. But even that information was difficult to obtain. Patience spoke in an archaic fashion, using words like thee and thou, and sometimes refusing to answer their questions directly. When Mrs. Hutchings pushed for more information, the spirit first replied by saying, About me ye would know much. Yesterday is dead. Let thy mind rest as to the past. Eventually, though, the ladies would learn that Patience claimed to come to America where she was murdered by Indians. The initial contact with Patience Worth came through the Ouija board when Pearl and Mrs. Hutchings controlled it, but it was soon evident that Pearl was mainly responsible for the contact, for no matter who sat with her, the messages from Patience would come only with Pearl present. Pearl was fascinated with the messages that they were receiving and began devoting more and more time to the Ouija board. Eventually, though, the messages began coming so fast that no one could write them down and Pearl suddenly realized that she didn't need the board anymore. The sentences were forming in her mind at the same time that they were being spelled out on the board. She began to dictate the replies and messages from patients to anyone who would write them. She would first employ a secretary, but later Pearl would record the words herself, using first a pencil and then a typewriter. For the next 25 years, Patience Worth dictated a total of about 400,000 words. Her works were vast and consisted of not only her personal messages, but creative writings as well. She passed along nearly 5,000 poems, a play, many short works and several novels that were published to critical acclaim, supposedly written not by Pearl, but by Patience Worth. People came from all over and the Korans, always gracious and unpretentious, welcomed visitors who wanted to witness the automatic writing sessions where Pearl received information from patients. Authorities in the field of psychic investigation came, as well as people from all over the country who had begun to read and admire the writings attributed to patients. 
The Currens never charged any admission to the house, and all of the writing sessions were conducted with openness and candor. There were no trappings of spiritualism here with darkened rooms and candles. Pearl would usually just sit in a brightly lit room with her notebook or typewriter, and when the messages began to come to her, she would begin to write. The stories were filled with ancient languages, words and objects that had not been in use for hundreds of years and more, things that there is no way that Pearl could have known about. Pearl explained that as the words flowed into her head, she would feel a pressure and then scenes and images would appear to her. She would see the details of each scene. If two characters were talking along a road, she would see the roadway, the grass on either side of it, and perhaps the landscape in the distance. If they spoke a foreign language, she would hear them speaking, but above them she would hear the voice of Patience as she interpreted the speech and indicated what part of the dialogue she wanted in the story. She would sometimes even see herself in the scenes, standing as an onlooker or moving between the characters. The experience was so sharp and so vivid that she became familiar with things that she could have never known about living in St. Louis. These items included lamps, jugs, and cooking utensils used long ago in distant countries, types of clothing and jewelry worn by people in other times, and the sounds and smells of places that she had never even heard of before. On one occasion, Pearl was shown a small yellow bird sitting on a hedge. Patients wished to include it in a poem, but Pearl had no idea what type of bird it was. Finally, Patience became frustrated and said, He who knoweth the hedgerows knoweth the yellow hammer. Pearl and her husband later consulted an old encyclopedia and saw that the yellow hammer in her vision was not a type seen in America, but only in England. In spite of the visions and odd experiences, though, Pearl never went into a trance during the writing sessions as a spiritualist medium would have done. She understood the writing as it came, and yet while calling out the words to the stenographer, she would smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, and eat. She seemed always to be aware of her surroundings, no matter what else might be going on with her. The controversy over Pearl Curran and her writing quickly polarized into two camps. On one side, the skeptics picked up on the various inconsistencies of her story. Not only was there no evidence that Patience Worth had ever existed, but at least one of the novels she wrote was set in Victorian England long after Patience supposedly lived. On the other side, Pearl's supporters stressed her limited education, making it unlikely that she could have written everything on her own. One researcher in particular who took an interest in Pearl's case was Walter Franklin Prince, who had already made a name for himself through the Doris Fisher multiple personality case, which we'll take a look at later in this episode. He first began studying Pearl Curran in 1926 and, after a thorough investigation, published The Case of Patient's Worth in 1927. Prince described the case as representing an unexpected display of literary genius, ability to carry on complex mental operations, together with apparent divination of other minds. While he was ambivalent about whether Pearl Curran was actually channeling patients, Prince wrote an article that was published in the 1926 issue of Scientific American titled The Riddle of Patients' Worth. In the article, he specifically asked anyone with information that could be related to the case to come forward. Nobody took him up on the offer. Whatever reservations John Curran might have had about his wife's link to a long-dead woman, he would keep careful records of the sessions until his death in 1922. Afterward, Pearl supported herself and her family through lecturing and financial help from friends, but the sessions went on. As time passed, Patience became tolerant but condescending of her host's abilities. Patience often scorned Pearl, but never failed to show her kindness. She simply seemed to think that her human counterpart was slightly stupid and that only by perseverance was she able to make herself known, especially when Pearl failed to grasp the spellings and meanings of certain words. 
but they plodded on together, continuing to amass a great body of work until about 1922. In this year, the connection between the two of them began to deteriorate, possibly due to changes in Pearl's life and the fact that she'd become pregnant for the first time at age 39. After her husband and her mother both died, the contact between patients and Pearl became less and less often, and eventually it died away completely. She received her final communication from patients in November of 1937, a little more than a month before Pearl's own death from pneumonia, which patients reportedly predicted. While later mediums would claim to receive messages from patients over the years, Pearl didn't seem inclined to make contact herself, nobody would ever match the quality of the original writing. But by this time, public interest in the mystery had faded, especially as no solution had ever been posed as to how the St. Louis housewife was accomplishing such remarkable feats. After the publication of several books and hundreds of poems, interest in patients' worth vanished and cynicism replaced it. Debunkers accused Pearl of hiding her literary talent in order to exploit it in such a bizarre way and become famous. However, exhaustive studies have shown this to be highly unlikely, if not impossible. Scholars have analyzed patients' works and have found them to be accurate in historical detail and written in such a way that only someone with an intimate knowledge of the time could have created them. Pearl Curran died in California on December 4, 1937. The St. Louis Globe Democrat headlined her obituary with the words, Patience Worth is Dead. And whatever the secret of the mysterious ghostwriter, it went to the grave with her. So what really happened in this case, and why does it remain today as one of our great unsolved mysteries? Was there actually an entity speaking to Pearl from beyond the grave, or could the writings have simply come from her unconscious mind? No verification was ever made that Patience Worth actually lived in the 1600s, and yet experts who studied Pearl Curran doubted that she could have produced the works attributed to the ghost on her own. She was a woman of limited education, with no knowledge of the language used or the history and subject matter that was written of by the alleged Patience Worth. Pearl simply could not have created the works of literary quality that have become known as the works of her spiritual counterpart. Although Patience Worth is still considered to be a genuine example of spirit writing by true believers, skeptics tend to regard the case as being an example of dissociation, if not an outright hoax. Although automatic writing has long been recognized as a clinical tool by Freudian psychoanalysis, its value has been hotly disputed by other clinicians. Research into automatic writing tends to be limited although the phenomenon has been linked to hypnosis and suggestibility. There have been more recent examples of literary works being produced through automatic writing, but the case of Pearl Curran is still the most well-known of its kind. So what was it? What did happen here? Was it a true case of afterlife communication or the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on both the literary and paranormal communities? It's unlikely that we will ever know for sure. In the meantime, Ouija boards continue to be sold, Parker Brothers still owns the trademark, but they're not as common as they used to be. Fledgling writers hoping to get published would probably be better off signing up for a good writing class. John Hatfield could not stay out of trouble, probably due to the fact that he kept making up false identities for himself and getting into trouble with those identities. His antics were so well known that later a woman who created a falsehood about herself was accused of being an imposter just like him. We'll look at both of their strange stories. But first, as mentioned in the previous story, one researcher who took an interest in Pearl Curran's case was Walter Franklin Prince, who had already made a name for himself through the Doris Fisher multiple personality case. We'll look at Doris Fisher's case up next. In 
Hey, weirdos. Well, the thriller slash horror movie that I've been involved with has been extended a few more days for filming. It was just taking longer than everybody thought, so we've had to extend it through the weekend, which means I won't be back in studio until Monday, October 28th. So, a few more days of me not being able to give you Overcoming the Darkness fundraiser updates. But that doesn't mean that the fundraiser is slowing down at all. We still need your help in raising as much as we can to help people who struggle with depression. The fundraiser ends at midnight Halloween night, so please give today and give as much as you can. And I'll give you an update as soon as I get back on Monday assuming I get back on Monday and that they don't expand the filming dates yet again. Hey, you never know. It's the film industry. <sighs> what have I gotten myself into? The political season is upon us, and those flying the red collars have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Long before Sybil and the Three Faces of Eve, there was Doris Fisher, and her case is still considered a classic, although little known these days. It was in 1910 when she first came to the attention of Walter Franklin Prince, then rector at an Episcopal church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Prince, who was born in 1863, received degrees in theology at Yale and Drew Theological Seminary. He would go on to become a prominent psychic researcher and psychotherapist, but it was the Doris Fisher case for which he was best known. When he met the 21-year-old Doris Fisher in his congregation, she appeared to be an extremely unhappy and lonely individual who was prone to odd mood and behavior shifts. She also seemed to experience bouts of amnesia in which she would forget what she had previously said or done. While Prince initially diagnosed her as suffering from hysteria, a common diagnosis for women patients of the time, he carefully studied her and concluded that she matched the clinical description of what was then known as multiple personality. Over the years in which Prince followed the case, he came to identify at least five different personalities, including Margaret, a child of about ten, sick Doris, who was a perpetual invalid, Real Doris, whom Prince regarded as the core personality, Sleeping Real Doris, and Sleeping Margaret, who only seemed to emerge when Doris was in a hypnotic state. It was Sleeping Margaret who seemed to have the best insight into how Doris's different personalities worked together and often helped Prince as he attempted to get to know each personality individually. 
through sessions with Sleeping Margaret, Prince was able to piece together some of Doris's background. She was born in 1889 of German parents, and her father was an alcoholic who frequently abused her. The possibility of sexual abuse was never raised, it was a taboo topic at the time, although it was never ruled out either. It was apparently in her early childhood that Margaret first emerged as a defense against the abuse and alternated with real Doris. The third personality, sick Doris, emerged after her mother's death when she was 16 years old. She reported a total amnesia surrounding the five-year period between her mother's death and when she first began attending Prince's church. Sleeping Margaret only emerged once Prince began treating Doris. Gaining access to Doris became much easier after Prince and his wife formally adopted her as their daughter. Not the usual clinical approach, I'll admit. He published a massive 1,300-page treatise on his prized patient in 1915. He named her Doris Fisher in his publications, although her real name after the adoption was Theodosia Prince. Prince would later publish another thousand-page treatise on the psychic experiments that he did with Doris. I mentioned that he was a psychic researcher, making this case the most well-documented example of multiple personality disorder on record. Over the years that he worked with Doris, Prince was able to reintegrate all of her personalities into real Doris, although sleeping Margaret still resurfaced at times whenever Doris slash Theodosia was in hypnosis. Multiple personality disorder, now known as dissociative identity disorder, remains a controversial diagnosis, not to mention fairly rare these days. There are some researchers who are of the opinion that many reported cases are iatrogenic in nature, meaning the illness is actually caused by the physician in some way. In the Doris Fisher case, there was a considerable blurring of the relationship between Doris and her therapist. Not only did she become Prince's adoptive daughter, but she was also his prized patient. He often introduced visiting clinicians to Sleeping Margaret, and she was a test subject in different psychic experiments. A later clinician would report that Doris's love for her adopted father was no ordinary love. She loved him not merely as a devoted daughter, she adored him almost as her god in that he had saved her from hell and had, one might almost say, given her a soul. Did Prince's expectations impose demand characteristics that shaped his adopted daughter's reported symptoms? Given the current controversy over recovered memory and the potential impact of directed psychotherapy on suggestible subjects, the possibility seems all too real. Information concerning Doris Theodosia's later life tends to be scarce although she experienced a relapse following Prince's death in 1934. Aside from the clinical report of the treatment that she received at the time, there seems to be nothing else available. John Hatfield was born in 1758 or 1759 at Mortram in Longdale, Cheshire. As a teenager, he found himself employed as a writer to a linen draper in the north of England, and in this capacity, he met a young lady from a neighboring farm. The young lady had been brought up to believe the people she lived with were her parents, but the farmer and his wife were nothing more than guardians to her. In actuality, she was the natural daughter of the British Army General Lord Robert Manners, who was to receive a dower of a thousand shilling if she married with her father's approbation. Hatfield discovered this and immediately paid his respects to the lady representing himself as a young man of considerable expectations in the wholesale linen business. When Hatfield met with Lord Manners, he also deceived him, for Manners, conceiving the young man to be what he represented himself, gave his consent at the first interview, and the day after the marriage, presented the bridegroom with a draft on his banker for 1,500 pounds. Flush with cash, Hatfield soon busied himself living the high life in London, and from the mid-1770s on, he was seen perpetually at the coffee houses in Covent Garden. 
It was also during this time that Hatfield exaggerated his kinship and relationships with important people. His exaggerations were to such a degree he acquired the title of Lying Hatfield. Eventually, he squandered away the 1,500 pounds given him by Lord Manners, and with no way to continue his high life, Hatfield disappeared from London, abandoning his wife and three daughters. After an absence of several years, Hatfield reappeared in London in 1782 but was imprisoned for a debt of 160 shillings. He soon claimed to be related to Charles Manners, fourth Duke of Rutland, and was able to induce the Duke to send him 200 shilling, which secured his release. Later, when the Duke became the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1784, Hatfield used his supposed relationship with the Duke to live for some time on credit, but ultimately found himself committed to Marshall Sea, where the Duke once again paid his debts but also temporarily sent him out of the country. John Hatfield could not stay out of trouble. In April 1792, he misrepresented himself, which was discovered when he failed to pay a hotel bill at Scarborough and was arrested. He remained in Scarborough's local jail for seven to eight years, during which time a Devonshire lady named Miss Nation took pity on him. Perhaps it had something to do with his good looks. Quote, his face was handsome, the shape of which in his youth was oval, his person genteel, his eyes blue, and his complexion fair. Unquote. On September 13, 1800, Miss Nation, quote, paid his debts and supposedly, though she had never spoken to him till he quitted the jail, married him the next morning, unquote. He and his new wife then traveled to Dulverton and Somersetshire. Once again, as Hatfield had no means to support himself or his new wife, he relied on fraud and deceit to acquire both money and credit. Hatfield soon returned to London, but this time when he arrived, he arrived in magnificent style. Unfortunately, just as he had done before, Hatfield spent every shilling, and when pressed by creditors to pay his bills, he used a tried-and-true strategy. He abandoned his second wife and two children. The same year that Madame Tussaud left Paris for London was the same year that Hatfield arrived at Keswick in Cumberland under the assumed name of Honorable Alexander August Hope MP for Linlithgow, brother of the Earl of Hopetown. To help alleviate suspicions Hatfield was who he said he was, he offered forged letters attesting to the fact. He also quickly made some beneficial acquaintances in and around Keswick. In addition, he made a fortunate acquaintance with a Liverpool gentleman named Crump, whose name and credit he employed as needed. The Tamworth Herald described Hatfield's appearance at Buttermere. One fine morning, a handsome traveling carriage rattles up to the inn door and out steps a fine gentleman in the breeches and boots of the period, his powdered hair tied in a club behind his chocolate fustian coat open at the throat to reveal a finely laced white cravat. With smiles and bows, the beau announces himself. He spends the summer months partly at Keswick, partly at Buttermere. To young ladies, his nice combination of deference and presumption was irresistible. Their mothers listened eagerly to the references to his estates in Derbyshire and Cheshire. And his ancient lineage, the martial envy of the men was stirred by stories of his exploits in the American War, desperate duels in France, travels in Egypt, Turkey, and Italy. His exquisite manners, fine dress, and station in life attracted the attention of Mary Robinson, also known as the Buttermere Beauty or Maid of Buttermere. The daughter of the innkeeper of Fish Inn, Mary quickly became enamored with Hatfield as much as Hatfield was enamored with her money. On October 2, 1802, John Hatfield carried off the Flower of the Mountains when he married Mary at Lorton Church. Newspapers announced the marriage, and it was at that point that certain community members learned the real Colonel Hope was living in Vienna. Before Hatfield could be arrested for being an imposter, he escaped but he was soon apprehended at a village 16 miles from Swansea. Ultimately, John Hatfield became known as the Keswick Impostor. He was charged with three indictments for forgery, found guilty, and sentenced to hang on the 13th of September, 1803. 
The Buttermere Beauty returned to her parents at Fish Inn and married a respectable, God-fearing farmer of Caldbeck. Newspapers publicized the doomed romance between Mary and Hatfield, and for many years after, the beauty of Buttermere became an object of interest to all England. Dramas and melodramas were produced in the London theaters, and shoals of tourists crowded to the secluded lake and the little homely cabaret which had been the scene of her brief romance. Anne Moore became famous as the Fasting Woman of Tutbury. That was because she claimed that from 1807 to 1813 she ate nothing at all. Of course, such a claim was ludicrous and eventually her claims were proven to be a hoax, and she was declared an imposter, just like the Keswick imposter John Hatfield. Anne Moore's story begins with her birth on the 31st of October, 1761 the same year that Eliza de Fweed and Madame Tussaud were born. Moore's parents were a day laborer named Thomas Pegg and a midwife named Mary. Moore was born in Rosliton, Derbyshire, a small village and civil parish in South Derbyshire, England, close to the county boundaries of Leicestershire and Staffordshire. In 1788, when Moore was 17, she tricked a Derbyshire farm servant by the name of Thomas Moore into marrying her when she declared she was pregnant with his child. Some people said it was James Moore, but Anne Moore claimed his name was Thomas. Regardless, Thomas, which is what we will call him, soon deserted her, and she was forced to survive by working as a housekeeper to a widowed farmer in the market town of Aston, about 15 miles from Tutbury. She became pregnant by the farmer and gave birth to two children, a girl and a boy. Around 1800, the same year that French artist Jacques-Louis David undertook a commission to paint Madame Ricamier, Anne Moore left Aston and made her way to Tutbury, located at Staffordshire, England, in the ownership of the Duchy of Lancaster. Moore had by this time converted to Calvinism, and in Tutbury she began to work as a cotton beater pounding cotton with sticks. Times were tough, wages were low, and she was suffering from dire poverty. To survive, she was forced to subsist on the minimum amount of food necessary to sustain human life. Tutbury locals soon learned that she was surviving on a meager amount, and they were also astonished to learn that she was conducting long fasts, which eventually helped her undertake the deception that she did not require food to survive. By November 1806, she had gained notoriety for her non-eating habits, and it was around this time that reports surfaced that she had lost all desire to eat. Six months later, she took to her bed, and then, on the 20th of May, 1807, it was noted that she attempted to swallow a piece of biscuit, but that she suffered such great pain that she began to vomit blood. It was then reported, the constantly repeated assertion of Anne Moore was that since the spring of 1807, she had not swallowed any kind of solid food, with the exception, once in the month of June following, on the inside of a few black currants, and that since the autumn of 1808, she had not swallowed any liquid whatsoever. She also maintained that she could not swallow, without danger of immediate suffocation, that she felt neither appetite nor thirst and had no evacuations. Of course, there were people who did not believe her assertions that she could survive without food. She therefore offered to satisfy the public curiosity by submitting to be watched for a considerable time. In September 1808, she was therefore removed from her home to the house of the local grocer, a Mr. Jackson, where all Tutbury inhabitants were invited to watch her and ensure that she ate no food and drank no liquids. An official investigation was then established in September 1808. It included a succession of four-hour watches that were undertaken by the chief inhabitants of the district and was arranged to cover a period of 16 days. During this period, bulletins recording her progress were published and posted, as was a list of the watchers. At the commencement of the ordeal, Anne Moore was described as terribly worn and emaciated, but as it progressed, she sensibly improved in health and spirits. 
Details of Ann Moore's undertaking were also reported in the pamphlets according to the Dictionary of National Biography. Quote, One learned writer proved that she lived on air, another that the phenomenon was due to disease of the esophagus, while a third was convinced that her condition was a manifestation of the supernatural power of God. Joanna Southcott declared that the advent of the fasting woman presaged a three-year famine in France. Unquote. Robert Taylor and John Allen, two local doctors, submitted reports on Moore's case to the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal in November and December 1808. Their report was generally held to be conclusive evidence of Anne Moore's veracity. Thus, for the next four years, Anne Moore attracted crowds of visitors to Tutbury, with many of these visitors making substantial donations that helped to support her. Among the many visitors to see Anne Moore was Mary Howitt, the famous poet known to have written The Spider and the Fly. She saw her when she was a child and reported in her autobiography that her father told her that most people did not believe Anne Moore ate nothing but rather thought she ate very little. Another visitor to see Anne Moore was Mr. Corn of Birmingham. He provided the following description of Moore in October 1811. Quote, her person is rather about the common size, and the just proportions of her features evidently show the remains of a fine face. She seems naturally to possess a lively disposition. Her understanding exceeds much of the attainments usually made by women in her sphere of life. She is ready in conversation, of a religious turn of mind. Her voice is at times amazingly strong, but greatly weakened by the proxisms of pain. In her person she is clean, and there is not offensive smell in her room." Unquote. In the summer of 1812, Alexander Henderson, physician to the Westminster General Dispensary, wrote, Examination of the Imposture. It showed inconsistencies and absurdities in Moore's statements. He also noted the curious parallel between her case and that of Anna M. Kinker of Osterbrook, who likewise practiced a similar imposture in Germany in 1800. Like Anne Moore, Kinker claimed she had not eaten solid food, drunk liquid, and had not passed urine or any other matter for several years. Henderson's allegations soon subjected Anne Moore to another watch by Lee Richmond, the well-known evangelical rector of Turvey. Moore was supposedly reluctant to submit to a second watch, and she also objected to the introduction of a weighing machine. But having survived one watch, she must have believed she could survive another, and so the second watch began on the 21st of April, 1813, and continued until April 30th. However, this watch did not end in Moore's favor, and she was soon shown to be a fraud, as indicated by the Chester Chronicle. Quote, the public are much indebted to the gentlemen who have instituted, and have with so much vigilance and impartiality, conducted the watch of Anne Moore of Tutbury. They have detected an imposture, which has the extraordinary art and success been carried on for some years, and which during that period has obtained, in regard to the supported validity of the woman's assertions upon the article of abstinence from food, the sanction of a great number of medical, philosophical, and other visitors of every description from all parts of the kingdom. It is remarkable that although many in various places had disbelieved the fact Yet those who have had the longest and minute opportunities of inquiring into the circumstantial evidence of the case, as it stood till now, thought themselves justified in their assent to its integrity. The cloak is, however, now torn off from the imposition, and the question connected with the truth or falsehood of this singular matter set at rest forever." Unquote. There were many things that indicated Moore was a fraud. For example, Moore's daughter, Mary Lakin admitted that her mother had always taken tea and that apples disappeared when set near Moore. Moreover, it was believed that Lakin had somehow smuggled food into her mother during the watch, and it was also evident that Moore was able to survive for some time on small amounts of liquids. Other proof included the fact that a gentleman was able to obtain the linen Moore wore. He reported that he found marks of copious evacuations thereby destroying any idea that Moore was not eating and drinking. A gentleman who lived near Derby also wrote a letter dated the 3rd of May, 1813, with the following extract being taken from it. Quote, the Tutbury humbug is over. The watch on Mrs. Moore began on Wednesday, the 21st of April, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and continued until the morning of Friday the 30th, 
when it was broken up at her own request. A machine had been provided for weighing her, and her average loss of weight was 16 ounces every 12 hours. Mr. Wright, a surgeon of Derby, sat with her for eight hours preceding the time when the business was closed, and she must have sunk from inanimation had he not supplied her with vinegar and water to the extent of six or eight ounces, which she sucked from a moistened handkerchief. Such was her state when the watch left her that the pulse was entirely gone at one wrist, and at the other was like a fine thread. It was thought that she could not survive, but in the course of Friday and Saturday she took some tea and a considerable quantity of milk, and she is now fast recovering. The state of her bed and clothes at the end of the watch, I hear, was quite shocking." Unquote. Having been proven to be a fraud, and Moore confessed that she had long been practicing an imposture on the public. She then signed a declaration stating as much. It was witnessed on the 4th of May, 1813, before Thomas Lister, one of His Majesty's Justices of the Peace. Moore's confession stated, I, Anne Moore of Tutbury, humbly asking pardon of all persons whom I have attempted to deceive and impose upon, and above all with the most unfeigned sorrow and contrition imploring the divine mercy and forgiveness of that God whom I have so greatly offended, do most solemnly declare that I have occasionally taken sustenance for the last six years. Many people were upset when they learned that they'd been duped by Moore the imposter. In response to her fraud and confession, the Liverpool Mercury reported, quote, When we reflect upon the gross impositions which had been successfully practiced upon the credulity of modern times, we must abate somewhat of that air of triumph in which we are apt to indulge. When we contrast the age in which we live with what are called the Dark Ages, scarcely more than a century and a half has elapsed since old women were burnt for witches. The temporary eclat which has successfully attended the Virgula Divinatorum or Divining Rod, the Cock Lane Ghost, Perkins' Metallic Tractors, Dr. Graham's Earth Bathing and Celestial Bed, Animal Magnetism, Magnetic Belts, Perpetual Motions, and an endless rarity of other successful humbugs, seems to show that there has been a mere change of superstition. Other old women or quacks have taken their place, with about as much pretension to the miraculous as the withered bags whose supernatural gifts were once so formidable to their neighbors and often so fatal to themselves. These reflections are suggested by the recent detection of the celebrated Anne Moore, whose pretended abstinence from food for so many years has occupied a large share of the public attention and almost given rise to a new theory of the animal economy." Unquote. After the discovery of Moore's imposture, it was reported that she had received as much as 400 pounds from her visitors, although it was also noted that she and her daughter had carelessly spent most of it. Some newspapers also maintained that she was so unpopular in Tutbury, she was hissed and booed whenever she appeared in public. That resulted in her leaving the city with 250 shilling, which she had deposited with the grocer Smith. Ann Moore and her daughter then commenced to ramble about the countryside. They eventually ended up settling in Macclesfield, a market town and civil parish in Cheshire, England. The same time that Napoleon Bonaparte was moved to Longwood House on St. Helena in December 1815 was the same time that Moore was accused of decamping with the wearing apparel and property of a woman with whom she had lodged. A search was made for Moore and her daughter, but authorities turned up nothing because the women had by then settled in Stockport, a large major town in Greater Manchester, England. Unfortunately for Moore, she was soon discovered, apprehended, and committed with her daughter Mary to Chesterfield Castle, where they were lodged the 22nd of February, 1816. Although there are some reports that Anne Moore and her daughter were sent to the Newtsford House of Correction for robbing their landlord. After serving their time, they were supposedly released from custody. A friend of Moore's arrived and together, Moore, her daughter, and that friend left for Manchester, never to be heard of again. When Weird Darkness Returns a home in India is grappling with an angry ghost that apparently has chosen to throw potatoes at it. And it began with a blast, the power of a nuclear bomb. Lights filled the skies. 
A fireball the size of the moon streaked across the sky. But this wasn't a UFO or anything paranormal or supernatural. This was all man-made, and it was only the beginning of something much more sinister that was planned. You've been hearing me tell you the past few days about how I'm on a film set for a horror movie right now. If you've ever done something like that, you know it's early morning call times, late night shoots, and then doing it again the next day and the next without a break. I used to rely on energy drinks to get me through those long days, but while it kept me awake, I was not actually feeling alert and energized. And it was a ton of empty calories with zero health benefits. Fortunately, I have Magic Mind mental performance shots now, giving me natural energy and focus. I found that taking mine around noon each day keeps me focused and motivated throughout the afternoon and evening. I don't have the caffeine crash either, so I don't need that afternoon nap anymore, which is something you cannot do on a movie set. That would probably be frowned upon by the director. As a Weird Darkness listener, you can get a huge discount on your subscription of Magic Mind mental performance shots, 48% off. Just visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get the deal. If you want to try it without a subscription, you still get a great deal with 20% off your one-time purchase. I've made Magic Mind part of my daily routine, and now it's part of my movie-making routine. magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get 48% off your subscription or 20% off your one-time purchase. MagicMind.com slash WeirdDarkness, promo code DARKNESS20. Uh, I wonder if we should put a special thanks in the movie credits for Magic Mind. This movie made possible by Magic Mind, because Darren would be too exhausted otherwise. Huh. Well, maybe. Hey, weirdos. Well, we're celebrating the anniversary of Weird Darkness, which began in October 2015. And as you know, every October we use this opportunity to raise funds to help people who suffer with depression. It's our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. We still have a long way to go. If you're planning on giving to our fundraiser, I would really appreciate it if you would give today, especially since I'm not going to be around because I'll be on the set of a horror movie filming and I won't be able to give the updates. So any gift that you give is going to mean so much. Every dollar you give is going to help somebody affected by depression. So no gift is too small. You can help us celebrate Weird Darkness's birthday, you can celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and you can also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in if you just make a donation to our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. To donate, or if you just want to get more information about the campaign, maybe watch a video that I created about it that explains it a bit more, you can go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming and thank you in advance for your generosity. Stones, potatoes, and assorted materials have been raining down on a house at Umtru in Ribai District, India recently but nobody knows where or by whom. Intrigued residents are now wondering whether this is paranormal activity. King Star Thong Nai, who is the owner of the house, told the Shilong Times that the chain of events began on a Friday night in late July around 10 p.m. He said there was a sound of knocking on the door of his parents' house located within a few meters thrice. Suspecting the handiwork of miscreants, the family informed the village leaders, who then visited the house and started a search. A few hours later, stones started landing at the front veranda of his house. On seeing this, the villagers who were patrolling the area started looking around to see if any miscreant was involved. However, none was found, prompting the villagers to think that there might be some kind of paranormal activity going on. Since reporting it, Thongnai informed that no one from the family has taken any material from the house as they were staying with their parents. Strangely, an opened box of potatoes was found with a finger mark, which Thongnai said was not theirs. From that time, potatoes, stones, as well as other household articles 
were being thrown inside and out of the house, despite the presence of people who were on patrolling duty. Even as this correspondent was talking to Thong Nai at around 9 p.m., stones were thrown at the veranda of the house. Thong Nai, who was father to two sons and a daughter, also informed that this was the first time that such an incident was witnessed. He's been staying in this house for six months now. Villagers who were also present at the spot informed that they were witness to the incident. They said that as some of them were inside the house, some were also outside, but the stones and other materials kept being thrown from the back of the house to the roof and the veranda, and some of the stones even fell on them, but fortunately no one was injured. This is not the first time that such activity has been reported in Rabai District. Earlier, a man at Pahamranai Village was also alleged to have had fights with a ghost at his house. It is said that paranormal activities do occur, though it cannot be proven scientifically. Only those who face it can express how horrible it is to witness or face such things. Old-timers say that if there are incidents similar to the one at Umtru Village, it is because the deities or some kind of supernatural force is moving through this route. On May 28, 1993, a remote and dusty thicket of the Australian outback shook for hundreds of miles around. Deep reverberating explosions could be heard far and wide, the night sky illuminated by sporadic flashes of unexplained light. All this allegedly witnessed by heavy goods drivers, gold prospectors, and nomads traipsing the bush. Three truckers even spoke to an Australian geologist about the lights, claiming that they'd seen a moon-sized fireball which flew from south to north with the speed of a jet plane. They said it was yellow-orange in color and had a small blue-white tail which lit up the sky as it headed immediately west for Bonjourn Station. The strange event registered just shy of a 4.0 on the Richter scale. Its blast could be heard over a radius of 90 square miles. The Australian government later dismissed the mysterious Temblor as probably being natural in origin. IRIS, the U.S. Federal Seismology Agency, said that the earth-shaking detonation was 170 times larger than the largest mining explosion ever recorded in that Australian region and was proven to have the force of a nuclear bomb. Some scientists speculated that it could have been a meteorite, but authorities found no signs of a crater as they searched for one via helicopter. Despite the fact that the epicenter of the ominous blast pointed in all directions to a remote research facility manned by Aum Shinriko, the notorious Japanese death cult noted for its attempts at mining uranium and its grim obsession with alternative weapons technology, the whole event was eventually shrugged off and forgotten about. That is, until two years later, when Aum waged its most brutal and notorious attack to date. On March 20, 1995, deadly sarin nerve gas was released on the subways of Tokyo via five trains. The stunt killed 13 people and harmed over 5,000 others in what is considered the worst act of terrorism in Japanese history. The caustic gas, a Nazi invention used to kill Jews, was pumped into plastic bags and dispersed by five men who pierced the sacks with their umbrellas while shuffling out of the tube. These men were all members of Aum Shinriko, whose ideology centers around preparing for a final nuclear skirmish with the powers that be as the end of days approach. Those behind the gassing weren't your average brainwashed cultists, though. These men all held professional qualifications that would hang prestigiously on any office wall. Among their ranks were a senior medical doctor and four graduated physicists, one of whom even finished with honors and a master's degree. They had the whole thing planned to a T, with getaway drivers and maps detailing their poisoning route. Most of the accused were eventually caught and hung for their crimes. But the oddball leader of the cult, Shoko Asahara, seems to have slipped through the cracks. Asahara was likewise condemned to be hanged, only the guy has mysteriously vanished within the Japanese prison system. There's no clear evidence confirming he's ever kicked the gallows or not, 
because Japanese authorities say he's alive. Yet his execution date passed years ago. What's certain, though, is that Asahara founded the cult in 1984 on a mixed bag of beliefs, which he deemed the supreme truth. He also believed he was the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva, and as commander of the sarin gas attacks, his aim was to throw authorities into chaos, hoping it would hinder their snowballing investigations into the cult. The group, now known as Aleph, is said to have over 50,000 members worldwide. They've kidnapped and murdered an anti-cult lawyer and his family for speaking out against them. They even have a lavish commune at the base of Mount Fuji. In 1990, members of the cult were convicted of murder after injecting toxins into the neck of an escapee's brother at the mountainside compound. The ruthless Am Shidrika was back in the news when a senior member turned himself in on New Year's Eve. He'd been on the run for 17 years. And so there he sat, guilty in the dock, trying to prove he wasn't too deeply involved with this insane cult by making strange faces and growling noises at the jury. By June, two more at-large Om members were arrested. Then one more, believed to have been a driver in the tube attacks and reportedly the last remaining Om member was caught. But at the time, rumors were circulating on the dark web that diehard Om Shinriko followers were reforming to fight off whatever evil was headed our way come late December 2012. They were only rumors, but some saw the Mayan prophecies and were convinced the world was visibly slipping into a state of imminent collapse at the time. The thought of Amshin Rico starting a nuclear war to combat the unlikely apocalypse is terrifying, especially if you look at the group's previous history. They've been investigated by the CIA for trying to buy nuclear warheads, and it's even said that they had at one point infiltrated the Kremlin you'd be hard-pressed to wholly ignore what could have been the Alm's biggest and most terrifying accomplishment to date, a Tesla death ray, potentially capable of causing ground-shaking knells not unlike a severe earthquake. It sounds a bit ridiculous, sure, but that brings us back to the 3.9 Richter scale explosion out in the Australian outback. The bizarre cult came to be after the almost blind Shoko Asahara took a trip to the Himalayan mountains and found enlightenment at high altitude. The doctrine for Om Shinriko followed, an amalgamation of Hindu and Buddhist spirituality beliefs, Bible scriptures, and Nostradamus-like end-times predictions. Asahara claimed he could save his followers when the end of the world strikes and that he could teach them the art of levitation. He even offered up his blood and bathwater for them to drink. For a price, of course. Somehow, the cult gained a huge following and earned itself a cutthroat reputation after its ranks began murdering anyone who attempted to leave or argued with their beliefs. As Om's following intensified, so did their plundered finances. And shortly after a failed attempt at dispersing botulinum bacteria, the most powerful neurotoxin on Earth which is injected regularly into the faces of rich housewives in the form of Botox, from their main offices in Japan in 1993, they decided to pack up and head for Australia. With a collective fortune then reported to be around $1 billion, Om Shinriko used some spare change to purchase 500,000 acres of land in a desolate part of Western Australia called Banjuan. So now, with a totally isolated plot the size of London situated in the wild outback of Oz to play around with, the Doomsday Cult members began transporting hulking gear into the country. The imported items included a JCB mechanical digger, mining equipment, an underground excavating machine, huge electric generators, gas masks, respiratory devices, and manual carrying equipment. The self-proclaimed alchemists also attempted to import lethal chemicals, substances like hydrochloric acid, sodium sulfate, and ammonium water. Some of these were labeled falsely as harmless liquids and confiscated by Australian customs on the way in. The Australian police filed a report at the time stating that the traveling cult members as a collective paid $20,000 in extra fees for their lethal baggage. But despite the would-be tip-off, all members were allowed to move into Bonjawan, where they set up a research facility. 
Staff at this nerve gas producing uranium mining laboratory are said to have not only represented highly educated and unhinged cult members, but also included two recently resigned Soviet nuclear scientists. To say that a 50,000 strong Japanese doomsday cult bent on stockpiling weapons for the Four Horsemen's arrival with privately owned land the size of a major city, hundreds of millions of dollars, a pair of Soviet scientists in tow, an unrelenting desire to spur death and destruction, and what would become a deep understanding of Tesla weaponry worked with Soviet professors on their rural Australian experiments may at first sound like something spouted from the lips of lizard-fearing David Icke, but sure enough, in 1992, Asahara was pictured rubbing shoulders with Oleg Lobov. Lobov was one of Boris Yeltsin's closest confidants and the chairman of the Russia-Japan College. This hardly proves the theory, but the cult's trip to the Yugosphere before their Australian outing flags up some interesting information, as does the fact that the CIA later discovered they'd been trying to buy nuclear warheads from the Russians. It was reported by the New York Times in 1997 that a collective of Am Shinriko members were sent to former Yugoslavia in 1992 to study the life and works of the seismic weapons expert, AC current discoverer, scientist, and lightning provocateur Nikola Tesla. The cult members pored over Tesla's thesis and researched many of his electromagnetic weapon theories, possibly with the aim to learn how to create them and stockpile them for their own armory. Their interest in plasma, earthquake, and weather-altering weaponry became so serious that the U.S. Senate and Air Force slyly launched an investigation into the cult. As a representative of the International Tesla Society told the investigators, Alm's interest focused on Tesla's experiments with resonating frequencies in connection with artificially creating earthquakes. They also tried to get hold of patents to some of Tesla's inventions, contraptions that the man himself stated could split the world in two. After this, of course, the U.S. Senate and the CIA properly delved into the group's Australian antics. A full investigation was launched, the true evidence of which will probably never see the light of day unless someone like WikiLeaks manages to unearth the secret documents. The whole thing then just conveniently drifted into the gray areas of tinfoil-hatted folklore. So, for now at least, we're left with more questions than answers. Is Shoko Asahara still alive? Did his singular cult in fact create and test something akin to Tesla's notorious death ray at an abandoned sheep station in the Australian outback? I don't know. But you just cannot make this stuff up. Join the dots with an open mind and, well, the whole awful thing is plausible. There is a distinct possibility that Om Shinriko were the first and so far the only people to have ever created and tested a non-government-sanctioned nuclear weapon. Think about it. They have tens of thousands of members worldwide. They've had university-trained physicists pop what were essentially giant nerve agent balloons on Tokyo subways, killing more than a dozen and harming untold thousands of others, all to roadblock the hounds. They have around a billion dollars in their bank account and have evident links with a once despotic government. If there was ever the perfect recipe for a cult-procuring killer earthquaking Tesla weaponry, this was surely it. Fortunately, they were all focused on the Mayan end of the world in 2012. Let's hope there's no Plan B in the works, because no amount of doomsday prepping will protect anyone from a makeshift Tesla tractor beam tearing through your apocalypse shelter. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share a link to this episode and recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share a link to the podcast, it helps spread the word about the show, growing our weirdo family in the process. Plus, it helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression, so please share the podcast with others. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links 
or links to the authors in the show notes. Patient's Worth and the Ouija Board was written by Dr. Romeo Vitelli for Providentia and Troy Taylor for American Hauntings. Terrifying Tater Tosser was posted at the Shelong Times. The Japanese death cult's plan to split the world in two was posted at Motherboard. The Keswick Imposter and the Fasting Woman of Tutbury were written by Jerry Walton. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And a final thought, do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. Maya Angelou. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>